Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online workshop, Scaffolding to Improve Learning. I'm your presenter uh, today. My name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at NIU. I earned my PhD in English from NIU in 2016, and I've been teaching college English for about 12 years. I teach a combination of face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online courses at community colleges, and so I teach students with a wide range of learning needs, which means that I often need to scaffold complex learning tasks to help my students achieve our learning goals. Now let's get to know you all in the text chat. Please tell us what your department or your division is, your role, and explain what you hope to learn from this workshop, and I will share some of that out um, verbally as I receive that. Um, if you didn't enter your name when you logged in or if your name isn't, isn't mentioned there, which I don't think that is usually a problem, um, I can see everybody's name from my end, um, then make sure to mention who you are as well if you need to. So your department or division, your role, um, and what you hope to learn from this workshop, and we'll just for a few seconds so that um, you guys can share that information. You all can share that information. Um, and I see several people are typing. Beth is a public health program coordinator and an instructor, and she just wants to continue to learn how to improve her teaching methods. Great. Welcome, Beth. Oh, we've got some uh, public administration, um, biology, curriculum and instruction. Some people want to know how to use Blackboard Collaborate, how to apply scaffolding to lab courses, um, and new ideas for scaffolding and online and hybrid courses. Great, we've got allied health and communicative disorder. Um, we have accounting, uh, NNGO, music, um, ETRA. Um, so a lot of people wanting to know how to scaffold techniques that they can use for their cl classes. What is the use of scaffolding? Which we will cover very early on. A couple more people are typing. Okay, great. We've got uh, one other person from chemistry and biochemistry who wants to learn some skills and strategies to help students to get study. Great. Um, so the topics that we're going to discuss in today's workshop session include explaining what scaffolding is, what some guidelines are for best practices in scaffolding difficult learning tasks, how to integrate scaffolding into a course, and some challenges to consider when implementing scaffolding in a course. And then we'll follow up just with a summary uh, of what we've learned, and then my list of references, um, which you can use for further reference. So first of all, let's discuss what scaffolding actually is. Uh, the social context of learning influences important skills like constructive meaning making and self-regulation of learning. And through the process of scaffolding, we can help students develop the skills to become self-regulated learners. So scaffolding is two part. Um, the first part is the systemic sequencing of prompted content, materials, tasks, and instructor and peer support to optimize learning, and a process through which students are given support until they can apply new skills and strategies independently. So you may be wondering why you should use instructional scaffolding. 
Uh, scaffolding modifies the traditional instructor role from a content expert who's imparting information on the class to a facilitator or mentor role. Um, and this accomplishes a couple of different goals. First, it reduces the dominant transmission model, wherein the instructor is the gatekeeper or the all-knowing being who bestows knowledge upon students. And then secondly, it encourages students to gain a level of autonomy over their learning through a guided practice. So in other words, scaffolding provides supportive instruction to support student learning. And scaffolding student conversations with the instructor and interactions with peers promote internalization, which leads to there being less of a need to scaffold for future similar problems or tasks. So in sum, scaffolding is a sort of deinstitutionalization of Learning. Uh, students are free to learn as individuals. Uh, students re receive intentional support from the instructor. There's a shared responsibility for learning, and students gain ownership over their learning events. Two important components of scaffolding are modeling and practice. The first step of scaffolding is the modeling process. And throughout the scaffolding process, the instructor should model each step in the task or the strategy as many times as necessary while talking through their thought process during each step. Modeling helps students know how to accomplish the task and why each step is necessary. Knowing the how and why of a process also promotes student success. After the instructor has modeled what they want students to do, the students need to practice them. Students individually or as a group should be given the opportunity to work collaboratively with the teacher and with each other to practice the task or the strategy and receive feedback to help them improve and progress towards those learning goals and hopefully removing that scaffolding. So what does scaffolding look like? Um, I'm going to give uh, a non-academic example to illustrate what this might look like. Um, so we're going to use the example of teaching someone to ride a bicycle. If we use scaffolding, we would first demonstrate how to ride a bicycle. We might start the person out using training wheels so they get a feel for riding a bicycle. We might gradually raise the training wheels up so that they aren't constantly on the ground while the person is riding the bicycle but are still there if they need them. Then we determine when the person was ready to remove the training wheels. Once we remove the training wheels, we would use a hand to steady the bicycle and perhaps walk alongside the rider. And finally, when they're ready, we would let go of the bicycle and let them ride alone. If they fell down, we would get, uh, add back that supportive hand to guide them until they were ready to try on their own again. If we didn't scaffold this process, it might look something like this. We explain to the person all the steps of riding a bicycle. We hand them a helmet have them hop on the bicycle, and then give them a shove. So which process do you think would be more successful? Would the person with no scaffolding learn how to ride the bicycle on their own? Perhaps, but it may take longer. It might result in more injuries in this case. Or if they think it's too difficult, they might just give up and never learn. The person who receives the guided instruction or the scaffolding, those supports, however, is more likely to succeed and less likely to give up because the new task is too difficult. So that leads us into our first discussion. So you can either type your answer in the chat thread or you can raise your hand um, by clicking on that little um, person raising their hand in the middle of your screen at the bottom. Um, and then when I call on you to do so, you can share verbally using your microphone. Um, so have you ever used a process of modeling in practice to teach your students a new concept, strategy, or process? If so, what did you do? How successful was your use of scaffolding? And if it wasn't successful, what do you think you could have done to make it better? So you can either, again, enter that into the chat um, on the right-hand side, or you can raise your hand if you want to speak up using your microphone. You can do that, too. So I'll give you a minute or two to think and formulate your answers, and then hopefully we'll get a few people to share, and I will uh, speak them out if they're in the chat. Um, Yasmin asks if we can consider a job aid as modeling. Um, and yeah, that's one of the types of scaffolding that we'll talk about today. So have you ever modeled 
what you want your students to do and then have them practice that. Um, so uh, we used a concept map when teaching a new theory in research design. That would definitely be an example. Um, first lecturing on, an, on assessment tools, then demonstrating some, and then having students practice with a case study, definitely. Showing students how to load a gel and use a pipette. Demonstrate the process multiple times, and then watch each student walk each student through loading the gel with the DNA sample. Great examples from different fields. Um, Andrea teaches larger core sections and finds that makes scaffolding more challenging, um, but she tries to walk through and discuss numerous, numerous examples of a concept before moving on, using discussion boards for students to demonstrate their understanding. Just take another minute for anybody else who wants to share. Okay, uh, sample concept maps, and then having students go off and make their own. Okay, so if anybody still wants to contribute, you can, and um, I will pipe in if anybody shares anything, but we'll move on to talking about three different kinds of scaffolding that you might use. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but um, it is manageable for our time here. Um, oh, we got one. Uh, recently explained an electron configuration to students who've never studied chemistry using a model to explain um, some don't listen and some can't understand, so that's a, definitely an issue there. Um, so if they, um, if some of them can't understand, then that might be a sense that uh, maybe we need to break that down even further and do a little bit more scaffolding too. Um, the not listening thing, that's a problem um, for a lot of different situations. Um, so definitely if the scaffolding isn't yeah, employed by students and then be difficult for them to benefit from it, right? Uh, so these are just a few different types of scaffolding that you might use with your students. Content, task, and material scaffolding. Uh, when we scaffold learning, we use a variety of supports as students progress through our tasks. We don't want to use scaffolding um, as a strategy just for the sake of using it. We want to choose the strategy or type of scaffolding that's going to work best to support student learning and our instructional goals. Um, so one type of scaffolding is content scaffolding for which the instructor chooses familiar or easier content to help students learn a new skill. That allows students to focus on skill building rather than being distracted by unfamiliar content. So for example, you might let students choose their own topic as you teach them how to use a particular writing strategy, um, including modeling the strategy and providing feedback on their guided use of that strategy before they then apply that strategy to a complex subject matter topic. In content scaffolding, the goal is to teach students the skill using familiar or interesting content to them so that they can eventually apply what they've learned to more complex course content. Another type of scaffolding is task scaffolding, and that's when the instructor outlines the steps in a process and models those steps for students while discussing their thought process aloud. The process of task scaffolding involves the instructor fully demonstrating and explaining the process step by step, and then slowly handing over the process to students to accomplish step by step on their own. And we saw some examples of that and uh, things that you guys were sharing. During the process, the instructor models each individual step, narrating what they're doing, and then students practice independently as the instructor provides guidance to students as needed. The third type of scaffolding that we'll talk about is material scaffolding. That strategy uses written prompts or cues to help students master content or processes. So I think that uh, job aid that you're talking about um, would fall under this category. 
These prompts could take the form of graphic organizers, cue sheets, guided lists. For example, an instructor may provide students with a handout that provides a list of steps in a process. Students practice using the guide, and then once students are able to organize their thoughts or complete the process, then the prompts are phased out as students gain a little bit more independence in that. Um, as those prompts are phased out, the instructor does need to check still for understanding to determine which students may still need that extra support. So students might be able to take, you might be able to take that scaffolding away for some students sooner than for other students who might still need that support. So um, that's where that individualization comes in. So as I mentioned, scaffolding as an instructional technique should be used intentionally. We use scaffolding when we first introduce new concepts and skills. We use scaffolding on an as-needed basis, and we'll discuss that more later in the workshop, so we don't need to use scaffolding for every single thing that we teach. Um, and scaffolding offers students socialized, supportive, and interactive instruction that helps them meet our learning objectives. So next I'm just going to share a quote from Hogan and Presley, and you'll see them on my references page, who state, quote, an instructor who stops by a student's desk to ask questions to determine her progress and then provides hints, subtle suggestions, and guidance to move the student along is using instructional scaffolding. Scaffolding is providing support to allow the student to think for him or herself. A good scaffolder looks for the point where the student can do it alone. So that quote, I think, highlights the important function of scaffolding, to eventually and intentionally remove scaffolds as students increase their competency. The ultimate goal of scaffolding, thus, is eventually not to have to use that scaffolding. So now we'll talk about the whether, the why, and the how of scaffolding as an instructional tool. The major question that you want to ask yourself when you're thinking about scaffolding is whether and how scaffolding would complement your teaching goals and students' learning. Scaffolding needs to make sense within the larger framework of your teaching, so it's helpful to articulate to yourself the role that you would like scaffolding to play in your teaching. So for example, scaffolding makes sense as students try to use competencies that they've just learned through direct instruction, through lecture, as someone had mentioned earlier. As you develop opportunities for scaffolding, you might eliminate counterproductive interchanges between students and the instructor. Um, so you'll need to ask yourself, are students spurring one another's thinking through thoughtful questions and comments? If you build scaffolds from that strong existing interaction, um, then you'll enhance that. On the other hand, if students are wandering off topic or communicating ineffectively, you might need to build different scaffolds to moderate those weaker modes of interaction and pro promote a more effective collaboration between your students. In addition to fostering effective communication and collaboration, scaffolds can be used to promote students' knowledge of content, development of individual skills, and expansion of cognitive or metacognitive strategies. So a question to ask once you've decided that scaffolding is appropriate for your instructional needs is how you will implement that scaffolding. Will you scaffold individuals, groups, the whole class, all of the above in some sort of combination? Um, so in sum, when you're considering how to scaffold, take some steps. Set motivational instructional goals. Determine in which context scaffolding would be beneficial for students. Decide what to scaffold. Decide how to scaffold. Match different scaffolds to appropriate context. Practice scaffold topics and strategies that you know well and make adjustments as necessary. So if you, um, in other words, have a scaffold in place and you're like, this is going to work for my students and they're going to get this concept and they don't get that concept, then you need to switch gears and find a different scaffold or maybe break it down even more if it's still too complex for students. So we want a just right level of difficulty for scaffolding in classroom instruction. We want to provide encouragement or praise. We want to ask questions. We want to have students explain their progress to help them stay focused on the goal as well when we're scaffolding. Successful scaffolding is most effective when students are motivated to achieve an endpoint that you and they envision together. So for example, understanding ecological relationships on their campus or publishing a newsletter for pre-service teachers, whatever um, topic you're studying. To make a scaffolding process effective, we need to control for frustration and discouragement, which can, as I mentioned in that bicycling example, derail students' motivation to keep trying. 
part of scaffolding is finding a simpler version of a task if students are experiencing great difficulty with an initial assignment. Those simpler tasks should progress into more and more complex tasks to give students the support that they need to build upon what they learn. One strategy for scaffolding is to ask lots of higher order questions to prompt deep reasoning rather than just recitation. These could include what if, what if questions such as what if no one on campus recycled bottles, cans, and paper, how would it affect the disposal of campus waste and the impact on the local landfill? So that's going along with that previous example of understanding ecological relationships on their campus. So asking those what if questions gets them to think critically. Think of scaffolding like the story Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We want to keep the tasks a little bit challenging. They shouldn't be too easy, but they shouldn't be too difficult either. Easy tasks can bore students, and they may fail to see why they're completing them. Really difficult tasks may frustrate students to the point that they want to give up. Tasks that are in that just right area motivate and engage students by making it seem possible for them to make progress with some effort. So we do we still want them to have that effort, though. So in sum, you want to use the following guidelines when scaffolding assignments. Recruit students' interests and establish shared goals for learning. Maintain the pursuit of the learning goal. Use a question-based interaction to get students thinking. And leverage students' cognitive and affective states and levels of competence. So don't make tasks too easy or too difficult. Students should progress with some effort. Feedback and self-regulation are also important for scaffolding. Throughout scaffolding, we need to monitor student progress and offer feedback. We want to summarize what students have accomplished so that they're aware of that progress. So we can either summarize what they've accomplished or we can have them summarize what they've accomplished. That's self-feedback. Encourage students also to decide for themselves whether they're making progress and if they're not encourage them to think about another approach too. That's part of being a self-regulated learner. Being indirect, like asking students questions about their understanding and performance, will encourage students to judge their own work and help them internalize those performance standards. Making your own thinking visible is also an excellent way to model that self-assessment process to students. So as we were talking about those different types of um, scaffolding and uh, using that modeling. While we're modeling, we want to talk through aloud our process, our th thought process, and then that helps students do that on their own too. You could also direct students' attention to important features of the problem as they work, and you should adapt your level of assistance to the level of a student's needs. In addition, targeted direct instruction, aka lecturing, can be useful during scaffolding. Um, so for instance, to initiate the development of a new skill before students are asked to practice it in a supervised and supportive activity. So our ultimate goal is to reduce students' dependence on scaffolding. Scaffolding allows instructors to help students become less dependent on instructional supports as they work on tasks, and it encourages them to practice the task in different contexts. An effective scaffolder takes student questions seriously, uses them as opportunities to help progress students' thinking. So you want to make sure that you understand students' questions before responding to them. Um, it's perfectly acceptable if a student asks a question and you're not quite sure how to respond to it to have them um, allow you to get back to them on that. <clears throat> and that also teaches them that they don't need to have all of the answers right away either. Uh, but that's a process. In whole class settings, you can help the rest of the class understand an individual student's question, but you do want to resist the temptation to just fill in the gaps in their thinking by giving them the answers. Instead, use prompts, use questions to encourage students to keep that thinking aloud process going, and then allow them to summarize for themselves what they've learned. While students are practicing those tasks, you want to give polite but accurate feedback on their mistakes and attribute any failures to a the problem difficulty, not their lack of ability. So we want to do what we can to minimize students' failure and maximize their success while also still keeping that challenge there. The purpose of scaffolding is to give them the tools that they need to succeed so that eventually they don't need those supports anymore and they can succeed without them. And there are a lot of tactics for responding to those errors that they might um, make during that process, including uh, intervening to make corrections, 
as you see them making those mistakes. The context of the assignment and the scaffolding is going to determine which response is most appropriate. So we want to keep in mind, though, that the scaffolding is formative. Students need to be guided. They need to be provided with constructive feedback to make corrections at that stage so that their misconceptions don't hinder them as they move further along in the process. As students progress, we want to slowly remove that scaffolding. We want to fade the intensity of that support as we release responsibility for determining the next steps to our learners. Also, we want to prompt reflection throughout that process so that students internalize the learning process. We also want to create and sustain a culture of thoughtfulness in our classes. We want to create a welcoming, safe learning environment that encourages students to take risks and to try alternatives. So if they feel that there's this culture of thoughtfulness in our classes, that we have a welcoming, safe learning environment, then they're going to be more willing to take those chances. They're not going to be as afraid of that um, failure. The social fabric of the classroom itself can become a kind of scaffold, especially when it's modeled after the social norms of the discipline that we're, they're studying. Gradually, a culture of thinking together with students will develop, and students will take on more responsibility for maintaining that culture, and that's part of that self-regulation process. So we should explicitly communicate to students how and why we are scaffolding their learning. Students should understand the rules of intellectual support and collaboration so that they can become master players of that game. The more that you make your scaffold style transparent, the more that you empower students to make the scaffolding partnership successful and uh, to eventually lead them to be self-regulated learners. Scaffolding instruction won't be the most efficient means of meeting every instructional goal, however. We need to decide where and when to scaffold, as I've mentioned. So in that, we need to determine which tasks students need scaffolded and which they can complete successfully with effort on their own. You'll need to be selective and target your use of scaffolding to those areas where it's likely to do the job better than any other technique. So we want to progress, as I've been mentioning, towards individual competency and removing those scaffolds. Scaffolding generally follows a process of progress from instructor-focused modeling and ending with individual practice and eventual mastery, or at least competency. So one, the instructor models how to perform a new or difficult task, such as how to use a graphic organizer. So for example, the instructor may have a partially completed graphic organizer on a PowerPoint presentation or a handout, and then think aloud as he or she describes how the graphic organizer illustrates the relationship among the information contained in it. Second, the instructor and the students work together as a class to perform the task. So for example, students may suggest information to be added to the graphic organizer. As the instructor writes the suggestions on the presentation or everybody fills out the worksheet, um, students are, are obviously following along and filling out co their own copies of the organizer. Third, students then work with a partner or a small cooperative group to complete a graphic organizer. So it could be either partially completed or it could be a blank one if students are progressing well. And then finally, the last stage. This is the independent practice stage where students can practice the task individually. So they might complete a graphic organizer to demonstrate appropriate relationships among information and then receive the necessary feedback to help them adjust their methods and perform the task successfully. Throughout all of these processes, we want to practice responsive scaffolding. So through appropriate questioning or giving them information that they need, the instructor supports the student in doing the task that they cannot immediately do on their own. After an error or an inadequate response, the instructor then provides responsive support to assist the student in making more adequate or correct responses. So we will now have uh, another discussion and we want to talk about what you will, um, what you think will be your unique challenges to scaffolding learning in your classes. So this is um, for maybe improving your scaffolding that you've already mentioned in our previous discussion, or it could be implementing scaffolding that you haven't done before. So what do you think are going to be your challenges to scaffolding in your classes? And we'll take just a couple of minutes to let you think about this. And then when you're ready to share, you can either type your answer in the chat thread or you can raise your hand and use your microphone when you're called upon to do so.
And this could also be an opportunity if you didn't participate in the, the last discussion um, because you weren't, weren't quite sure whether you were scaffolding or when you've scaffolded. Um, now with the information that you have, did anything pop into your head, um, you know, come to mind uh, that you realize that you do use scaffold, scaffolding in your classes? Um, Andrea says that she, as she mentioned earlier, her class size is large. She has around 80 students in a class, and individual level work is tough. Um, so she suggests that she could try to find ways to work in more small group work that might help. It's definitely a good, good idea. All right, and uh, Miliana, I hope I have that correct, um, says it's sometimes difficult to gauge students' understanding as there's sometimes a lack of participation. Um, and they think they're going to implement a pretest. Oh, thank you. Um, they think they're going to implement a pretest or a quiz to see if there are problem areas and then scaffold those areas. That's a good idea. Um, so, not quite sure where students are going to be at, you can definitely do a pre-assessment or diagnostic to see what areas they might have challenges with. Um, and then, oh, we've got a couple more here. Um, some students can't follow models. Um, when they feel confused in the first or second step, they might give up and do anything else instead of listening and understanding. That's true. So um, that might be, you know, a sign that we need to maybe break down even that first or that second step um, or do some more modeling too. Um, so, you know, if they can't follow the step, you know, maybe model it a few different times or in smaller groups too. Because, um, yeah, if they can't get that first or second step, then they might shut down. It might be too difficult. So we want it to be in that just right area. Not too hard, not too easy. Um, and then we have another one, uh, very lecture heavy classes um, um, that you TA for. So you think you can suggest that it might be beneficial to have more discussions and then try to incorporate scaffolding. Definitely. Um, so lecture definitely has its place, um, but we definitely need to also see whether students are, you know, getting, uh, actually learning the material that we're trying to impart on them. Um, so you definitely can use discussion to try to gauge that, uh, see where they might be having problems as you go around to discussions, if either in a whole class setting or in smaller groups, and then incorporate appropriate scaffolding as necessary. Um, and then another issue uh, is students understanding concepts. Um, the lab course that you teach builds on the lecture material that's so which is scaffolding, but students need to perform an experiment and sometimes that material gets lost. So um, that seems to be an issue with maybe transferring from the lecture to you know the the performance. Um, students can put more emphasis on completing the task and not understand what's going on. Um, they do have a lab assignment questions for them to answer for each lab and um, she encourages them to ask lots of questions so they can really understand the concept. Yeah, um, encouraging question asking um, and, and even, you know, going around to individual students and maybe noticing that they're having trouble um, and prompting them, you know, for that too. Because sometimes even if we ask a whole class, does anybody have any questions or is anybody having trouble? And then they, nobody wants to raise their hand and speak up in front of the entire class, but give them time to work in class and then go around and then a lot more people suddenly have questions um, and need more support. Great, so anybody else want to share 
what might be some unique challenges to scaffolding learning? Let's give it another minute or two. And again, if you want to use that microphone, you can raise your hand and, and speak up too. All right, so we'll move on, and if anybody shares, then I'll, I'll be sure to share that out. So some challenges and caveats just to scaffolding in general, and as you've mentioned, there's going to be individual challenges that'll pop up depending on, you know, the class and, and what the task is uh, and uh, what your discipline is, um, the size of your classes, all are going to be challenges that are individual to your courses. Um, but some of the challenges of scaffolding that um, are that faculty need to have extensive insight into individual learners. We need solid content knowledge. We need to know what learners already know, and that's where that diagnostic might help or that pretest. We need to understand what competencies are within the reach of our learners. So we need to know what's uh, reasonable for them to attain. And we need to anticipate or gauge what mis misconceptions learners might have. So in other words, scaffolding requires a high level of insight. Ultimately, you need to know the curriculum well to be able to foresee areas that might require scaffolding. So in what ways can students go wrong, which interventions help, and for which students. And scaffolding can be demanding and time consuming as well. It takes up a lot of time to pick things apart and break things down and have students practice and practice until you know they no longer need those supports or they need fewer supports and fewer supports until we get them down to that independent um, uh, level. So we want to use scaffolding only when it's appropriate to do so, and we want to provide it to those who need it when they need it. Once we've decided that scaffolding is necessary, we need to identify the content or the task difficulty level, and we need to develop the necessary related supports. Um, so a lot of this comes with just doing it over and over again, semester to semester. So scaffolding you know, we might develop some scaffolds that work one semester, really great for that class. Uh, and then the following semester, we use those same scaffolds, and they aren't working so well for that class. So we need to regroup and figure out what's going to work for that individual class of, of students. Um, so just because something has worked in the past doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. Um, you know, students might have different challenges, might uh, need scaffolding in different areas um, from semester to semester, or even from section to section in the same semester. So it, it does require a lot of work to, to continually be monitoring that um, and figuring out where you need to make adjustments um, and where our scaffolding is and isn't working. Um, so again, when you're beginning to use that scaffolding, you need to continually evaluate your prompts, your assignments, to determine what works and what doesn't. We want to have a variety of options available. Um, and as I said just now, what works for one group of students may not work for another section of the class or a next semester's class. So we may have to experiment to see which scaffolds work best in diverse classroom settings. Some other challenges and considerations, um, some large classes, as several people have mentioned, they, they teach large classes. You may want or need to scaffold individual groups. Group tools could include cue cards, question cards, question stems, you know, so you'll have to figure out what works best for your discipline um, and for the task that you're trying to scaffold. Your class also might include learners with diverse communication styles, so you want to try to leverage those styles to enhance student learning. We want to be aware of communication styles that may cause classroom management management issues, too, um, and make sure that we're designing scaffolds that are going to benefit our students and not reinforce any potential classroom management issues. We also want to provide our students with ownership of their learning goals, which also requires work. Um, Encourage students to practice self-regulated learning, prompt one another's thinking and learning. Um, so that's where that group work comes into. Um, so help them support each other. 
Student assessment should be attentive to the kinds of gains expected for, via the scaffolding. So in other words, we don't want to evaluate them as if they're turning in a final product or as though they should already be competent in the process. We need to evaluate them um, in a formative way. So we want them to receive feedback so that they can improve the process uh, and lead up to that final assessment so that they're successful on that final assessment. We also want to consider students' thinking process in addition to learning products. In other words, we want to provide feedback on the effects of the scaffolding and the progress that students are making towards more complex tasks rather than just focusing on that end product. As students learn new processes, they need instructors to be positive, patient, and caring so that their learning is supported, and they aren't afraid to put forth the effort necessary to grow. So we want to create that classroom culture. And if your scaffolds don't work, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll work one day and they won't work the next. Um, we need to be responsive to what's happening with student learning. We need to monitor what is helping students progress towards learning goals and what isn't. If a scaffold isn't working, we need to share and try something else that might work better. Or if uh, you know that first step or that second step is still too complex for them, we need to figure ways to break it down even more so that they're still being challenged, but they can achieve those first few steps, gain that confidence, and then progress as the, the process or the task becomes more complex so that we can remove the scaffolds eventually. So as a summary, we want to begin with what students can already do. Students need to be aware of their strengths. They need to feel good about the tasks that they can do with little or no assistance. We also want to help students achieve success quickly. Although students do need challenging work in order to learn, that frustration and cycle of failure may set in quickly if they don't experience frequent success at those initial stages. We also want to help students quote unquote, be like their peers. They want to be similar to and accepted by their peers. If they're given the opportunity and the support, some students may work harder at tasks in order to appear more like their peers. So that's where that smaller group work might come in handy. Um, we also want to know when it's time to stop the scaffolding, when we want to fade it. Practicing is important to help students remember and to apply their knowledge, but too much might impede the learning. Less is more may be the rule when students have demonstrated that they can perform that task. Also, finally, help students to be independent when they've commanded the task, the content, or the activity. We need to watch for clues from students that show when and how much our assistance is needed. Scaffolding should be removed gradually and at a pace that's appropriate for students' uh, progress. So for some classes, maybe you remove the scaffolding a little bit quicker, um, or for some students in an individual class, you might be able to remove that scaffolding a little quicker, while some students might need um, a more gradual removal or fade. So as students begin to demonstrate their mastery and no longer need those scaffolds or don't need them as much, then we no longer provide those scaffolds when they can perform that task independently and when they become more self-regulated. So here's just a list of references, and I can send these out to you. Um, and if anybody would like a copy, a PDF copy of the PDF, you can mention that in the, the chat. Um, I can send that out to everybody as well. Um, and then you'll be able to click on any links that are in this references page and have that handy. Um, but this is just a list of some of the resources that are out there. There are a ton more resources uh, out there about scaffolding and different uh, strategies for scaffolding um, for different uh, subject matters. So the first one, for example, on this list, does visual scaffolding facilitate students' mathematics learning, uh, evidence from early algebra? So there's content-specific scaffolding resources, too. Um, there's a couple of books here, uh, and um, the IRIS Center has a tutorial on providing instructional supports, uh, facilitating the mastery of new skills. That's where I got that bicycling example from. Um, so if you want some more of that, um, they have the three different um, styles of scaffolding, and they've got some other examples in there too, and some videos that you can look at. Um, so uh, I will send this out if anybody wants that. Um, 
And if anybody has questions about teaching and learning or scaffolding, you can contact me. But this is a, I would like to give you guys the opportunity if you have any specific questions at this point um, at the end of our, our workshop, um, just to let me know. It, either you can use your microphone um, or you can let me know in the chat. So if anybody has any questions specific, I will give you a couple of minutes now and I will try to answer those for you. And if you don't think of any right now, that's totally fine. You can send me an email later, um, or you can contact us at FACDEV, and we would be happy to help you with any individual needs for teaching and learning. So I'll give it a minute or so, and if you have any questions, please let me know in the And if you don't have any questions, do feel free to um, to exit the, the Collaborate session. Thank you, Ileana. Thank you, Yasmin. <clears throat> but I will stick around uh, in here for the next 10 minutes or so. And if anybody has any questions after I uh, end the workshop, then you can feel free to stick around too. Thank you all.